Shout out to Snowball, our incredible new sponsor, a private community where top entrepreneur investors share private deal flow, wins, tough lessons, strategies, get advice, and so much more. Check out www.snowballclub.com. Let's grow together with Snowball. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Steven Spear and we're going to talk everything about buying and selling small businesses and the uh, financing thereof. Steven, thank you for being here today. I want to uh, thank you for taking your time, sharing your knowledge with us, and this is going to be a, a fun conversation. Thanks for having me, Ronald. Cool. We're always going to start off in our origin, kind of, who are you? How did you get into this space? I always joke around, the famous joke that I do is, I don't know if it's famous, the, the same jo- joke I do with every guy is, you were born, and then you ended up on a show about mergers and acquisitions. How did you end up here? So give us give us uh, your background, man. How did you end up on a show about mergers and acquisitions? What is it you do? And we'll talk about the company, too, like what, what the company does. Sure. I mean, I've been in lending a very long time, as you can tell by my hair color, and I've primarily focused from the start on business acquisitions. And then, uh, and then roughly 10 years ago, I got more specialized and, and really did a lot of acquisition financing within the e-commerce slash SaaS space. And the business has very much evolved to the point, I mean, we've done over 500 transactions for over a billion dollars worth of financing. And we're really quite, uh, quite involved with the m a community, and it's always fun to see people throughout the year at various events, but I enjoy what I do, and I like helping people, helping either groups or individuals acquire businesses. Tell us a little bit about what separates you from something like the SBA lending program and stuff, or the other options that are out there. Yeah, I mean, we do SBA financing. That's a bulk of our business, but we also do business financing for lower middle market transactions, typically with enterprise values, let's say 10 million and above. Uh, I think our biggest deal we're working on right now is 150 million. So, uh, but we do quite a bit of SBA financing and what sets sets up apart is that we're very much specialized in doing SBA financing within the online business space, which is, uh, there are a lot of different nuances there. So when you say online, are we talking e-commerce, membership sites, newsletters, or just all of the above SaaS companies? Yeah, e-commerce, which is kind of like saying Kleenex, right. pretty much incorporates product-based businesses. A lot of them sell on, on Amazon and Shopify and Etsy and some of the others. So we do that. We also do more product or more service-based businesses, like SaaS businesses, where they sell their uh, services online, typically. A lot are educational technology companies that are around. That's ever growing and ever evolving to be a larger portion of our business. So what is, what does an ideal client look like for you guys? Is it, you know, if somebody came, they're, they're listening right now, they're looking at buying a company. How do they know that you're the right fit? I think it depends on also the size, but our lower market transactions, it's, They're primarily professional individuals looking sometimes looking to get out of corporate America and, and running their own businesses. And instead of establishing their own business and having that risk of being a startup, they actually buy a business and then grow it, grow it from there. And usually they have some sort of either strong indirect or strong direct skill set to be able to accomplish that. So that's kind of the lower market silo Our lower middle market silo. Again, generally transactions from about um, 
10 million to 250 million. Those are typically groups of individuals or two or three individuals, partners uh, who have an established business who want to perhaps a roll up strategy and buy additional businesses and grow their, their portfolio. Do you have anybody out there who has raised funds and what they do is I, I don't, I, I've interviewed two people in the last seven days who they've raised funds. It's a debt raise, but what they do is they, they use their funds for fast closing. And then eventually they go through like a more traditional finance company like yours and refinance those acquisitions out so they can free up the capital to do more quick closings. You, do you work with stuff like that too, or? Those are more difficult because there is a two year waiting period and, and generally so no, not typically. We don't work with those types of scenarios. It, the two I, and those waiting. generally are smaller acquisitions. Like they're buying something for half a million dollars and then they do it that way. But on the larger uh, deals, there's typically not a necessity to do it that way. We shore up the financing for them. So t- sometimes there's an equity co-invest piece and they, they acquire the, the business. Yeah, one of the guys I was talking to, they buy uh, assisted living facilities. So a lot of times they are, yeah, you know, that's short of a million dollar acquisitions and stuff, but he, he has a hundred million dollar fund that he's raised, but I think, I don't, I don't know what the time scale is, but I want to say that they have the ability to roll over or cash out at the end of every year. So he refinances a lot of stuff. A lot of his stuff is real estate back too. He's buying the real estate underneath it. So a lot of times he can refinance the real estate and pay the investors back. But I was just yeah, makes it a lot, especially of their stock acquisitions. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about the, the company. Tell me about kind of what you guys look for. How do people kind of pre-qualify or know that they, they're themselves qualify and the deals they're looking at? Where I'm kind of beating around the bush yeah. for, I guess, is I, I hear way too many times where somebody brings a deal to a lender like yourself and then the lender goes, well, you structure all this wrong. We're going to have to restructure this to get it done. So um, yeah. how do people prepare to, to get a loan from you guys? Yeah, and that's that's very common, and that's why we have a, a, a kind of a program that you know allows us to pre-qualify an individual really early on, typically before they even start searching, and then assist them during the search and be able to vet the businesses that they fall in love with during the search to make sure those businesses qualify for financing. And then when they're ready to move forward with their offer, we assist them with crafting their letter of intent or contract and making sure that the financing available and their offer mirrors each other, because if they don't, back to your point, they're sitting there having to re restructure their deal. I hear of that a lot, actually. Pre-qualification, is it something online they do? They fill out a form, then they have a call with you guys, or how does that work? Well, we have them fill out two basic forms online and schedule a call with us. Mm-hmm. Then during the call, we deep dive and we really find out what they're looking for, what they're kind of get additional color on their personal liquidity and their business acumen and really try to uh, kind of inform them or educate them on the process. Many of them have never bought businesses before, so we're able to educate them and we take very much of a on hands or hands-on ed- consultative approach with our clients. I know the SPA has their own set of requirements and stuff, and then most banks and lending institutions layer something on top of it, their own criteria. Mm-hmm. What, what switches over when we get above that $5 million acquisition price that SBA can do and you're starting to do institutional type of lending where you're doing these 10, 15, 20, even $100 million deals, what's different in the pre-qualifying process and uh, the process in general? Uh, is vastly different. So there are kind of three, let's call it three buckets. There's SBA financing, which is financing up to $5 million. Then there's Financing for businesses typically in kind of the one to two million dollar EBITDA range that not only have the SBA portion, but they have an additional conventional loan on top of that, which is called Parapasu. So there, there, there's that type of financing. And then the lower middle market financing are typically Ronald for businesses of two million dollars in EBITDA or higher. And that's a completely different world. And that's that's a world that we've been that we started uh playing in a few years back. And yeah. The pre-qualification process is vastly different because typically it's investor money that are buying these businesses, not individual. It's not based on individual personal liquidity. It's based on investor funds. And we, you know, they provide us proof of funds, et cetera. And then as they look at businesses to acquire, 
We're able to vet the business and, and give them an idea of what type of financing. Well, if we give them a green light, what type of financing, what the deal structure would most likely look like. So similar, but not, not quite. A lot of differences, especially um, on the, the loan facility. The loan is completely different than SBA. The reason I, one of the reasons I was asking is I was on a call earlier today with a gentleman who has raised $235 million and they're doing a roll-up strategy. And I won't say what industry it is or anything. I don't want to cr- increase because it's, it's a brilliant idea what he's doing and I don't want to induce any, any uh, competition for him. But one of the things they did in their strategy is they went and got institutional investors to back them up. So the institutional investors said that they'll finance up to 70% of the acquisition in this industry, and then they only have to put their money, their 30% for it. So they basically got to dip into their, their raise for 30% of each of the acquisition. And I'm sure they're going to make some, you know, some portion of that be owner carry or earn outs or something like that. So an acquisition is going to be a mix of their money they raise, some institutional lending, and a little bit of earn outs to hit the full amount. Do you guys work with that middle, that institutional? Do you do? Uh, we, we do primary. I mean, we do have uh, many of our deals do have earn outs and seller equity roles and seller notes, et cetera, but we don't go to the institutional level. How do you guys work with on these bigger deals? I'm, I'm just, my curiosity is about the team because I know at the individual level, the SBA is going to require some familiarity with the industry, some proof that you're able to run this company, some background. When you're looking at these bigger teams, how do you create a great team that the lenders are going to approve of, the banks are going to like? I bring a team to you. You know, how do what is a rock star team for you guys? On the smaller deals or the larger ones? No, it's going to be the larger ones, right? Usually the smaller deals are one or two yeah. guys, right? Yeah. I mean, we do look at direct industry experience. A bank or a lender, be it private equity or a traditional bank, et cetera, they're not going to stroke a $10 million check or $20 million check to somebody who's never run a business before. So we look at, we look at the team and typically each team member has a certain skill set, be it previous SFO or uh, CFO, pre- previous CEO, et cetera. And we just look at the overall team and also the amount of uh, equity they're willing to bring to the table. And then we kind of work forward from there. All right. So um, what is what are some of the tips? Right, let's start with the small deals because we've got, we have kind of multiple buckets we're talking about here. On the smaller deals, what would you say in your area of expertise, online, online transactions, e-commerce businesses, and basically anything, SaaS and all that, anything that's done online, what would be your tips for vetting deals to make sure that they're lendable? As our clients search for acquisitions or search opportunities, they provide us with the SIM, you know, the confidential information memorandum and financials of the business. And obviously we already know their background because we've already talked to them and had, you know, discussions surrounding that. And then we, we basically cash flow the business and look at how the business is obtaining uh, revenue. And we move forward from there. And then we, we basically do a debt service analysis to make sure the business qualifies for financing and how much leverage it qualifies with. So is it a scenario where, you know, 90% leverage, 80% leverage, et cetera, and kind of determine it from there. Now, I know the, the SBA loans require personal guarantees and, and a bunch, you know, <laughs> pledging your firstborn child <laughs> and everything else, right? It's you're fully guaranteeing the loan with assets Not and that stuff. Bad. I'm teasing. But uh, the mid-tier and the, uh, the upper ones, how do you guys secure the loans on those for, these, for the institutional investors or the private investors? What, are they secured yeah. against assets too, or, or how does that work? So I'll just start kind of with the lower ones. With SBA, like you mentioned, it requires a personal guarantee. And if there's available collateral, which is typically limited only to maybe primary residence where they're put, they'll put a lien on the house, those are... Th- those are requirements there. Our middle tier also incorporates a SBA 7A loan. So that requires personal guarantee as well. And then our lower middle market deals where we're providing capital from our private equity firms, those don't require, they have no recourse. They don't require a personal guarantee. Every once in a while they do, but it's very rare because ultimately it's a corporation buying another corporation. So it's, it's vastly different uh, playing field there. So those don't require personal guarantee. 
For each of these, what are we talking about timeline? I kind of understand the timeline of a typical SBA loan, um, but for what is the timeline for, just for everybody knows, what's the timeline to walk an SBA loan through you with, with you guys? And we'll talk about the others. Yeah, so typical timeline, once we have everything from our client is 60 days, generally 30 days for NRA, 30 days to close. That's pretty standard. Um, the entire timeline is predicated on the candidly the expeditiousness of our clients. If they take a month to get us everything that we need from them, then it, you can add 30 days to that 60 days. So now we're at 90 days. And then the lower middle market tier, generally, um, it's vastly different. Generally, we're waiting on a quality of earnings report, but usually that's also all in usually 60 days, about the same, basically. Far less pick intensive, I will say. What are the lessons you guys learned over the years? I mean, with the billion dollars of transactions, there's some, there's definitely lessons you learned about the industry. Are you guys concerned about the cycle right now in the economy or you know, how does that, any of that come into play? I mean, in terms of lessons, I don't know. I think bad deals only get worse. So we tend to turn those opportunities down. Bad buyers only get worse over time. So those are kind of internal lessons. If we just don't like either the client or the potential client or the business, we move on to the next. We're not into doing, uh, you know, writing bad loans or uh, working with people that we can't get financed. And that's led to last two years, 100% loan approval rate. Historically, we're at 98%. So if we're moving forward with, with a buyer, he's closing unless something out of our control happens. So, and we we're proud of that, candidly. That's pretty impressive because that, uh, that doesn't exist in most uh, other industries. That means you're vetting the buyers and the deal fairly well before you get there. Because yeah. certainly the SBA doesn't have that type of closing rate on general. Like most of the brokers I talk to, the loan brokers, they won't claim that, right? That says you're doing a lot of pre-work and a lot of hand-holding through the process to make sure what's being presented to the bank is really well vetted. Very much so, yeah. I mean, that's and that's why, honestly, that just about, or I'll say most, online business brokerage firms use us exclusively. And sometimes buyers go to them with a financial institution already in mind, and they won't accept the offer unless they work with us, which is says, you know, they have the option, but they, they normally get, don't get their offer accepted unless they work with us because we, we have the reputation of getting people across the finish line. And unfortunately, standard banking institutions do not have a good track record. They, on average, close 63% or get, they get 63% of their loads approved, which is pretty bad. I think that's a D in, in, in school. So that's not a very good rating. Yeah, I run into people all the time who they go to their local banker because their local banker says, oh, yeah, we do SBA loans. But the local banker doesn't tell them we've never funded an a e-commerce loan ever, right? If you look yeah. at their loan history, yeah, they do SBA loans, but it's for mom and pop shops, plumbing, electrical service, everything that's in their little town around that bank. That's what they're used to. That's what their customers are. And that's what they're used to lending. When you come to them and say, hey, I want to buy a I want to spend the full $5 million for an e-commerce site doing a million dollars in transactions and the bank looks at it, it's out of their zone, their comfort zone. And in a lot of these small banks, even though it's SBA loan, they still have to go through an internal board approval to loan, especially a $5 million thing. So yeah. a lot of times these buyers and stuff, they'll get on one of my networking meetings go, I've had two banks turn me down. I said, like, where did you go? Oh, I went to my local branch and I went to the one of the bigger branches down the road, I said, no, what I want you to do is, number one, not all SBA loans are equal. Uh, every bank has their own criteria. They lay on top of it. Find the industry that you're in, like for you guys, e-commerce, go out and find somebody that's what they've, their last 10 loans are in that, in that industry. They love that industry. Yeah. They know it. They're comfortable with it. They can walk you through it. They can help you get the deal done even. So it sounds like you guys do that for e-commerce. Is there any particular, like if I looked at your track record, if I hunt it down, like what's the last 10 deals you guys close? Is it all SaaS or is it primary one? Is there any sweet spots where you just focus a lot of energy on or is it pretty broad? A mixture of SaaS and product-based e-commerce businesses. Yeah, I mean, that's the vast majority. But what's interesting, Ronald, we're doing more and more brick and mortar deals because some of our clients are looking at both, you know, brick and mortar opportunities as well as online or you know, e-commerce opportunities. So, and they're like, gosh, you've been great working with us with you, it's been great working with you thus far, but I want to buy this HVAC business. And we do those loans. Um, they're easier actually. So 
even though we're specialized in e-commerce, we're specialized because it's more difficult to do an e-commerce, to provide e-commerce financing. Whereas tr brick and mortar, we've done a ton of brick and mortar over the years. So it's, uh, it's a lot easier. I think brick and mortar is easier because you, you have a lot of hard assets you can actually collateralize, right? I look for a lot of brick and mortar stuff, just be, especially ones that have real estate, because now I've, if I can buy the real estate with it, I'm a previous real estate guy. That's what I did before I got into this yeah. space. So I'm, it's my comfort zone. And I know if I need to help, if I need money to close or I need help later on, I can do things like sell lease back and I can free up a lot of cash by not owning the real estate and just leasing it from an institutional investor that'll back me. So, uh, yeah, the e-commerce, that's one thing I was entered. That's why I interviewed you and uh, I wanted to interview some other people in the space because they're not necessarily asset backed loans. Now the SBA is going to look for class, you know, your personal collateralization. But when you get beyond that, the asset is the business itself, right? And it's exactly. history and the employees and the ability to prove that you've, you know, been in business for years, making money. Do you guys, I know one of the companies we interviewed recently. They won't touch a company that's been around for you know less than eighteen months. Do you guys have like to acquire it? Is there like a normal? Is there anything like that? Any type of requirement where if you're going to buy an e-commerce company, it has to have been around for X Y you know, X, X period of time? Hey there, how to exit family? Today I'm thrilled to talk about Snowball, our incredible new sponsor. This community is more than just an investment hub. It's a place where growth is holistic. A private community where top entrepreneur investors share private deal flow wins, tough lessons, strategies, get advice, and so much more. Snowball is a network rich with like-minded, experienced entrepreneurial minds, including investors, founders, CEOs, and doers all dedicated to meaningful growth. Snowball threads are like a daily masterclass. This isn't just about financial success. It's about enriching your entire life. If you're looking for a community that supports your entire entrepreneurial journey with shared wisdom and collective support, check out www.snowballclub.com. I believe their approach to compounded growth in wealth, health, network, and relationships could be the game changer you've been seeking. Let's grow together with Snowball. We look at mostly two years of tax returns, which is that encompasses 24 months, so two full tax years, and then we're good to go. Okay. But 18 months, you're, you're going to be hard pressed finding anybody in touch your business that hasn't been around at least two years. Yeah. yeah. I was curious. I know they went down to that. I was a little shocked because personally, I don't, I don't want to touch anything that I don't get to see three years of full of full, but I, I'm not, I'm 52. I turned 52 today. So when this comes out, I'll be three weeks, th okay. two or three weeks older than 52. I'm not, I'm a lot less risk adverse than I was in my twenties. Right. I, I did a lot of startups in my twenties and thirties and I guess I was in the military in my twenties, but in my early thirties and stuff, I did a lot of like, Hey, let's, show, let's, let's throw some money at this and see if the, if the market likes it, right? Let's create a business. Let's do a startup. Nowadays, I look at these things and that's the reason I'm in this space in the merger and acquisition space is I want to see something that's up, run and has a history of it. And it's not mine to build and grow. It's mine to not mess up, right? <laughs> if I get in and leave it alone and just help it do what it's always done, it's pretty safe bet. And then maybe I can tweak and make it do a little bit more or bring in the right people and they can help it do a lot more. But, uh, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to pull 80 hour weeks trying to pull something out of the gutter. So, uh, do you guys look at some of that stuff to you? I guess financial history, are there any type of turnarounds and stuff that you guys will back or does it pretty much have to be extremely stable? We don't catch fully knives. So no. Okay. <laughs> most villagers won't, I had to ask, but most villagers won't. Right? Yeah. And I admire people out there that do catch bowling knives and turn the business around. But yeah, we're not in that scratch and death business. We that mostly is, look at businesses that are growing year over year. I've met a few. I've met a few like in the UK and stuff because they have companies house and they can actually like early detect that. They can see when companies, because here in the United States, we got this cool thing where you can operate in a shoestring and behind on your bills and, and, and scrap, scrap it and make it until you make it. In Europe, they can't do that. So the, the, the court can call you insolvent because you can't, if you don't have the right balance sheets, basically. And it's a national database. So even as a small business, you have to report, I think it's either quarterly or semi-annually, uh, what your finances are. And if you're insolvent on those reportings, they can actually force you into insolvency court and shut you down. So there's guys out there who do turnarounds that follow those, that look for diamonds in the rough. And uh, some of them, I've interviewed a couple of them that are just really good at that. Again, that's not my forte, but I was curious if you guys, you know, or if you 
have done loans in, in that realm where the team can turn it around so you'll loan them the money. It sounds like not. There's not really people that will. I would have been yeah, shocked. Then, I guess. You can find private investors that do that where, you know, but not standard type lenders. Where are you guys located? So, uh, uh, like, are you guys nationally or across? You go, can you lend in all 50 states or? Yes. Yeah, we're, yeah. We have clients. Our headquarters are here in Tampa, but we lend throughout the country and yeah, we, we have no borders here. <laughs> Do you, we have, I have a lot of international listeners, Australia, the UK. I host uh, twice a month. We host a hangout, like a meetup where we brainstorm and help each other like solve problems inside of this space. A lot of those guys are from the UK and stuff, and they want to buy companies in the US. Are you able to help facilitate that? I know the SBA has some rules where the LLC has to be the US based and the primary shareholder, I think actually has to be US based, but do you work with, uh, you know, did any of the programs you have, can they, can my UK guys come to you guys and finance an e-commerce thing or is that? Yeah. So business is over $2 million. Uh, I will say our capital providers are a lot more selective mm -hmm. when that's the case, but we have done businesses uh, or have done acquisitions on us based businesses for foreigners. Yeah. Like I know a guy right now, I'm buying, he's in the UK. He has a trucking, has two trucking businesses in the UK that he bought and merged and he's buying an $18 million one here. Now he's raising capital to close that. So $18 million is a total asset purchase. I mean, it's the purchase price. He sent me a message. He goes, who can help me raise 18 million? And I was like, yeah, I do. And I sent him a couple of links to people that raise capital, but it's equity. It's investor raised and it's a company that, that's what they, it's a company that raises capital that said, um, Talk about like the process, like walk me through kind of what, what would a, what would a, a buyer or a search funder or whoever you call it, ETA guy, whatever you call it, the, uh, the operator, the guy buying the business, what should they expect to walk through? What does it look like? Are they going to be on calls with you? Kind of what is the life cycle of this? I know it's going to be 60 to 90 days, but kind of set some expectations for the listeners of to what to expect. Yeah. Our process starts well before that point. Our process normally starts when people are ready, you know, ready to go look for a business. So typically they'll go to our website or be directed straight to us. And we send them out a couple of links, a couple of basic forms to fill out really easy. And then at the end of the last form, they click on scheduling a call and then they schedule a call typically within, typically they'll schedule a call and we'll be on the phone with them typically within 24 hours, maybe 48. Mm -hmm. And then we just, we go over the assessment form that we have and then really do a deeper dive on what they're looking for and ultimately, you know, educate them on our process in terms of as they're looking for businesses to make sure that we, they have us vet any opportunities that they're interested in moving forward with. And then um, we help help them along every step of the way. And in many cases, help them with the LOI because most of them haven't completed an LOI before. So we help them with that. And they, they present their offer, offers accepted. And then we start the loan process along with them, uh, hiring a, typically a due diligence firm to do that. So that's the process. So you're, you're involved through the entire process. So you, they come to you, you have some back and forth there. I'm just recapping this. So I know, know it, you get a little bit of back and forth and then they start vetting companies. They start actually doing their lead generation. They start talking to companies and prior to an LOI, they're showing you these financials and saying, Hey, I think this is one. So that they, they're probably seeing five or six before they pick one and bring it to you and go, Hey, I think this is what I, I want to do. Right. And, uh, Oh, absolutely. I would say 10 or 12. I'm being nice. And, yeah. And sometimes, then we'll, sometimes we'll a hundred. <laughs> yeah. We have some of those clients. <laughs> I look, I look, I look at a lot more businesses these, than I make LOIs on. So we right. basically tell them unless they're, you know, unless they had at least an initial call with the seller or really done a little bit more than a deep dive on the business, don't bring it to us because we have had those clients, Ronald, that are like, here, here are all these businesses I'm interested in. And we're like, no, <laughs> they're right down to like two. And then we, you know, we bet the business, we cash flow it. We look at the business and determine the revenue silos and whatever. And then with the intention of issuing a pre-qualification letter, just to show them sources and uses. And then they're more confident. They've been, they've been pre-qualified. The business has been pre-qualified and now they're ready to move forward with their LOI. And oftentimes they, they allow us to help them with that. And then ultimately they hopefully get their offer accepted. And we also oftentimes help them build their acquisition team, which is going to include 
the attorney, us, the lender, due diligence firm, and all the players involved in, in moving forward and ultimately achieving ac acquisition success. It's awesome you guys help with that because a lot of the guys think they can take on some of these roles they probably shouldn't be taking on. There's yeah. not a single new buyer out there that should be doing due diligence on their own. I, I don't care if you're a CPA. There, there's something about a third set of eyes looking at financials and looking at them from a lender's point of view, even, you know, a critical point of view of whether or not it's a good deal. There's a thing we jokingly inside of the industry call a deal heat. If you get excited and you're all, all you think that they're really attractive and you kind of overlook certain things because you, you just really want to get one done. You want to be, you've been doing this for six months, eight months, 12 months. And now you've got one that's yeah. interesting. You fall in love with this thing and you're going to, you know, you'll tend to overlook a lot of things. I don't believe anybody should be in doing their own due diligence. I think we should all have a third set of eyes. Even if you're good at it, you should have somebody else look at it from a non-biased. Uh, there's a thing inside of our own brain called cognitive biases where we believe we want this. And all, my, all of a sudden, you know, we do that. I grew up a, I'll give you a good one. I grew up a painter's son. My dad and I painted houses, oh. right? And we, we, he would paint one side of the house and I'd paint the other. And he'd go, okay, and like, you know, I'm done. He goes, okay, I'm done. And we'd switch, right? I'd go look at his side and i find all these spots. I'd be like, man, you missed this and you missed this. this and I, he'd be on the other side of the house going, man, you missed this, you missed this. <laughs> but if you, even if, and I got so frustrated because I'd always step back and look and because he would tease me about it. Like, look at all these spots you missed. I was like, you know, I've been working on yours. And he goes, that's why we do this, right? If you work on something for a few hours and you look back, your mind actually tells you it's all done. You'll actually, you'll even on paint, and even if you're changing colors, your mind will actually fill in the spots. It's, it's weird. It plays tricks on you. Wow. And then the other guy comes over and he's like, he knows you missed something and he just sees it. He's just glaring at him. And that happens with these financials. It happens with legal structures. Even if you're an attorney buying businesses, have somebody else do your legal due diligence. But I love that you guys are helping people build that team. If I'm an investor and you know somebody wants me to uh, invest in a company, which I currently don't do at all because I'm trying to buy my own. <laughs> but if I were to do that and somebody said, well, I'm, gonna, I'm an attorney, I'll do my own legal due diligence. I'd say, okay, we're done, right? Just because I know that there's that cognitive bias. When you get excited about something, you tend to want to see the best in it. If they don't, we've had clients in the past say, well, I don't want to hire an attorney. And we're like, we're out. We're not working with it. Well, why? You know, because you're going to be asking us legal questions and we're not attorneys <laughs> because in the past and, you know, historically, that's exactly what they do. They'll start asking us, well, what, what do you think about this? And we're like, we're out, we're, we're tapping out. So we require our clients. Well, we don't, we just tell our clients, if you don't hire an attorney, we're not working with you. And it's not in a conceited fashion. It's just, we're not attorneys. And that's, it's just amazing. And then back to in terms of like the wrong way of going about acquiring a business, I kind of want to touch on that a little bit. We'll have clients come to us after their LOI is accepted. They don't have personal liquidity. They have no idea how they're going to buy the business. And then the business doesn't qualify for financing. And most people do it that way, which is amazing to me. They don't have a clear, concise way of ultimately crossing the finish line with an acquisition. Even clients that come to us and we pre-qualify them, we lead them to the water, but they, you know, they, they'll come to us with an LOI and it happened actually today. We tell all our clients before you go forward with an LOI, even if you don't have us look at the LOI before it's accepted, have us at least vet the business to make sure it qualifies for financing. We had to convey bad news to one of our clients who decided to go on his own and not have us vet the business. And ultimately business does not qualify for financing. And. He's under LOI, so he's going to have to cancel. Yeah, well, lucky for him or them, most people make their LOIs non-binding, which I didn't understand at first, but I kind of get now. But uh, there's just something to be said for planning ahead and knowing how it's done. Now, there is a strategy inside of that. I know two people that do this. They go out, they know that the business is not lendable. They know it from start, but it's a good business. It may not be lendable because of the industry it's in or just it's maybe too new or they just changed uh, markets you know, too recently. They made too many big changes recently, and mm -hmm. that, which that scares a lot of the lending institutions. But they know that, and they go ahead and say, they go through that, they do the LOI, and they take it to a lender, and they come back and go, hey, we're going to have to renegotiate this. You're going to have to own or carry more of this, or we're sell or finance a lot more of this. It's just nobody's going to be able to get a lender. I've talked to three of them, and it's not lendable. And I knew they knew that beforehand, right? It's a negotiation tactic. I don't think it's fair, but a lot of times... Sellers don't want to hear that their business is not lendable, right? So now yeah. when a business is not lendable, they have two options or three options. Keep the business, four, four options. Keep the business, sell or finance the business, 
find a full investor who has like the full amount or stroke a check. And those are far and few between for most of these small businesses. Most people don't mm-hmm. want to, you know, do that or they have to just shut it down. Like, you know, retire. And I'm sure there's more than that, but it does happen. But these guys see it as an easier conversation. They go, yeah, yeah, we'll go talk to the banks and they give you the full check. And then they know, they know what, you know, they've been in the business too yeah. long to, to know that this just isn't going to happen. Right. I had one recently where they made too many changes recently. I said, look, if I take this to any lender on the planet, they're going to tell us, no, you changed too much in the last year. Your revenues went from three and a half million to one million. You're still now it's starting to climb back up and stuff. But when the bank starts to do the due diligence, their own background on this, they're going to see the reason it drops so much is you made some major tr- you know, changes to people in the company, changes the structure on how you manage. That stuff hasn't vetted itself out yet. You're not a stable company yet because you made these changes and now it has to restabilize. And I don't think a lender on the planet is going to touch you guys. And those are the same people that, that spray and pl- pray LOIs all over the place. <laughs> we know a few of those characters. They've been, they're on our, you know what, list. And uh, if they contact us, we go, we don't even reply. They just like LOI, 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 LOI. And they never close on anything ever. So it was bad when I was in the real estate. It's even worse in the real estate community and the real estate community. When the market's reasonable, it's not super hot. I know investors that would literally submit two to 300 offers on sight unseen on houses a week. And then what they, and Basically, they just did a mathematical calculation that if the house is in perfect condition, I'll offer 75 or 80% of perfect condition of the house. And then if the seller reaches back and says, yeah, or so much percentage under the current listing price, if they say, yeah, then we they accept the offer, then we have our uh, inspection period. And then we come back after the inspection and say, oh, wow, this is all the stuff we found. We have to renegotiate the price. And they, they succeeded doing it. I mean, they were getting deals done. But man, that's irritating, especially if you're uh, like a business like we were, who had 30 or 40 listings on the market all the time. I just got to where if I seen a, you know, an offer from these four or five companies, I knew what they were up to. And like, I just denied it right off the bat. I never signed one of them, right? Because I knew yeah. that wasn't the offer. That was the get us under contract, make us take it off the MLS, right? Take it off the market. I'll tell you the problem with that is, and it's happening in the real estate world already. It'll happen in the business world too. As this becomes more popular and people are scattering those LOIs, there's a thing we, in, in the commercial world, we can sue for non-performance. And um, if you, I think that somebody's going to breach that, like, you know, they say, I tell you, it's the LOIs are, are non-binding. But if if you have a non-compete on top of your LOI, like, like we do, if we put an LOI in something, we have like a 60 year, if I'm going to pay for due diligence, I want to certain period of non-compete you can't you got to take it off the market i think there's a failure to perform clause in commercial real estate if i put an offer on your place and then i don't turn around and close on it i can be sued for failure to perform on the contract for any losses that person would have had for having not taken it off the market and and it's fairly common i think that enough people get burned enough business owners get burned you're i always joke around you're one senator's son away from having a new law that'll change this thing you're going to burn somebody's son or kid or, or whatever and also we're going to get law you know the same way we have interesting wall, laws regulating real estate investment now that didn't exist 10 years ago it's the spray and pray the more people go out and do these loose knit methods that uh dirty up the market the more rules and regulations will be put in to stop them from doing it if they're hurting business owners it, 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 it originally you know that's how things get regulated yeah it's un- unethical it's unfair i mean imagine selling your business you pull it off the market for six weeks eight weeks, whatever that number is. And then the, the buyer, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm backing out. I think honestly, I, I think LOIs are need to go away. I think people need to go straight to contracts, put down earnest money, just like real estate. That's my own personal feeling. Unfortunately, that would be great if more business owners were honest and accurate and there was less things that popped up in due diligence. The reason LOI is there is so that we can start due diligence. And I, this, I haven't seen one yet that the story didn't change drastically, especially when a broker's involved. I've yet to see a a very honest, very straightforward, 100% no change broker on any deal. And I haven't heard of them yet either. So usually you can, it's built into the market some, but uh, you're going to find stuff during due diligence. You're going to find stuff that, uh, you know, they, uh, I always kind of akin it to a poker game. The first set of financials, the first thing they show you is their poker face, they're bluffing, right? There's something else there. Like, they don't really have four aces underneath there or a royal flush. They got a crappy little straight or something that you could beat. 
until we get more transparency in that, I think the LOA is just a placeholder for, hey, I'm really serious. Now show me your financials. Show me some more serious paperwork. But I can see it going away if we went, if we were like Europe and they had companies house where they federally had to report their financials on a regular basis and they had to be fairly accurate. Maybe, you know, they're, that, that could go away. Yeah. Or somewhere in between, like not LOI, not contract or somewhere like in between. Yeah. Uh, some of the deals, they go LOI and they do, what's the next one? There's a letter of intent and there's a, there's something else yeah. for contract. I forgot the initial. I, I don't know too many people that use it, but uh, you have a letter of, uh, letter, LOI, letter of intention. And then there's a, we always put a non-compete clauses on it, but a lot of guys will step into kind of a more formal thing before they, before they do the due diligence. I'll think of it in a second here. But, uh, well, there's a in, huh? the indication of interest, then letter of intent. And then typically it goes to asset purchase agreement or stock purchase agreement. Yeah. yeah. I'm thinking more along the asset purchase agreement, but I forgot what I was talking to one group of people and before they enter due diligence, it becomes a lot more binding, right? That the, the seller can't back out because some of these due diligences, you do legal due diligence, financial due diligence, stuff like that. You could be talking tens of thousands. You should be talking tens of thousands of dollars on a million dollar EBITDA company. It's going to, it's going to cost something, right? Typically it's about. Thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. If, if the quality of earnings reports I'm more referring to, those are thirty grand. I mean, starting you buy a very large company, um, you know, let's say hundred million dollars plus, it's going to be a couple of hundred grand. Yeah. Now I'm referring to just the financial due diligence and the uh, legal due diligence on even an SPA deal. Those are you know still going to be probably ten to fifteen thousand, right? Right. 10 grand for e not only legal, but probably 10 grand legal, 10 grand, grand, you know, standard due diligence. Yeah. So yeah, it, it could add up really quickly. It, it makes you, makes you really pay attention to what you're going to go into due diligence on because you better be pretty sure. Cause that can add up pretty quick, right? If you have, think about, you go through four of those before you actually get to a close, right? You know, you got a hundred, a hundred grand tied up, 80, 90 grand tied up into Fell closings. I've seen it in the real estate world where we have escrow. We have to fight to get the money from escrow back because a lot of times it's just hard to get those checks back. So it got to where our closing attorney, I don't, I would only, I would never give an escrow check to anybody but our closing attorney, right? Because I know I could get it back from him if they failed to close. So uh, mm -hmm. tell people how they can get a hold of you. Tell people like kind of if somebody has more questions and they're not ready, quite ready to fill that out, what's the next step? You know, that type of stuff. Go to our website, ecommercelending.com. If you have more specific questions, just email me, Stephen, and that's with the PH at ecommercelending.com. Okay. And then anything coming up? Do you guys, you mentioned earlier, you guys went to some events and stuff like that. Do you guys go to events and anything coming up cool that's happening in the next few months or? Uh, not next few months. Too big. A lot of events are later this year. Yeah. McGuire Woods Independent Sponsor event is one. There's an SIG event, I think in Dallas in September as well. Prosper is coming up in, I believe, April. So we are not attending Prosper this year, but that's more of an online right. event. But um, there are a few M&A groups on LinkedIn that you could follow and they're all host. A lot of events are coming up. Just we're very selective on which ones we actually go to. Yeah, we put them in our newsletter when we find them. It's one of the reasons I always ask our guests, hey, you, gonna, you know any cool events coming up? Because we have a growth and acquisitions newsletter that we run. And at the bottom of it, we have an events calendar. So we're always looking for, hey, what's out there? I Google around a lot too, but sometimes things just don't show up well in Google and you'll know more about it than, than you know, somebody hasn't promoted or had the SEO right. There'll be some cool event out there that slips through the SEO cracks. Well, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for teaching us. We've asked a lot of questions. If somebody can only walk away with two or three takeaways for today, what would you want them to walk away with? I would say get pre-qualified have your lender pre-qualify the business and put together your acquisition success team before you buy a business. I, mean, I think those are our three takeaways there. That'll help them get to the success. Well, thank you again for your Just time. Just have your thoughts in a row and you'll, it'll happen. And lastly, have patience. You're not buying a house, you're buying a business. It takes a long time to find that right opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today. And we'll call that a show. Ronald, thanks for having me. All right. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. 
ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now